Praise the Lord. I'll be my very best. You will you be your best? You will. And the Lord will bless what you offer to him in Jesus' name. I will stand in our pass will pray or will prefer to say I know what you want to do. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you at this time and we bless your name. Thank you because of this Congress and thank you because of our choir orchestra and our people who are here to serve us. I will praise your name for the service everyone is rendering. I will pray, O oh Lord, your bless our service in Jesus' name. Thank you for all your ministers, our overseers, our leaders, our pastors, and all the people you have called and you have commissioned us and you have given us this great work to do. Lord, we pray you destroy the power, the desire, the energy, the faithfulness to be a very best for you. You grant to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you'll keep us strong so that, Lord, as we face the challenging ministry ahead of us, we'll do it faithfully. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can see now, God bless you. We come to something very important, something very central, and something very essential. When you think about the gospel, and the reason why we present the gospel, and the reason why the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher, and the prophet and the apostle, the reason why we minister is so that the Lord will call out a people for himself out of darkness into light, out of sin unto the Savior, out of the confusion of the human life, he calls us into his rest. And he has given us Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that that Jesus Christ will be able to save, will heal, will deliver, and then bring people onto his side. That's the reason why in what we preach, and wherever we're preaching, and whatever text we're using in preaching, Christ must come out. If you happen to go to Genesis, and you're preaching and you're talking about creation you don't want to finish until you talk about christ the creator and the one that recreates us if you go to genesis and you're talking about the fall of man you don't want to finish until you talk about christ who has come to redeem us from the fall of man if you are talking about cain and abel you don't want to finish until you talk about the blood that speaketh better things than that of abel if you are talking about abraham you want to talk about the siege of abraham i want to talk about christ anywhere you go in the bible in the old testament in the new testament in narratives in the parables in the experiences in the things that happen christ is the center and we need to understand that and you'll find us what the apostles did in the new testament that anywhere they went anything they wrote any congregation they were speaking to they always came to the very fact that jesus christ is the all in all there is the centrality of christ in the saving gospel we present christ as our savior we present him as our sin bearer. We present him as our substitute. We present him as a final sacrifice. So that when we're preaching, you're not just telling stories. You're not just enlightening the people. You're not just giving religious knowledge. You're not preparing them for a religious exam. You're preparing them to see who Christ is. The centrality of Christ in the saving gospel. You present him as our righteousness. He is our redeemer. You present him as the mediator. You present him as the messiah. You are presenting him as a sanctifier. The one that makes us holy and keeps us holy and keeps us pure. 
you're presenting Christ as a healer, as our deliverer. You're presenting him as a baptizer in the Holy Ghost. You present him as a prophet, priest, and king, and as a pattern. You're presenting him as a shepherd, the one that gave his life. So that we can be redeemed as a supplier, as our strength, and as our sufficiency. You present him as the hope of the world. And we come to see what those apostles did, how they preached, and how they did it creditably well. That whatever congregation they were speaking to, Paul the apostle, it might start with those who are totally ignorant. And he's talking to them and he's saying, yes, I see that you have so many gods and you serve the unknown God. And the one you serve without knowing, I come to introduce him unto you. And then he ends up talking about Christ, his death, his resurrection, and what Christ means to us us the jews and the gentiles to the whole of humanity and so it's very important that we understand that as the lord has called us to preach and to declare the totality of the counsel of god you want to see that christ is presented in a very convincing way a christ is the savior that's why we're looking at this message the centrality of christ in the saving gospel i mean acts of the apostles chapter 26 acts chapter 26 and i'm reading there to you from verse 22 and verse 23 having therefore obtained help of god I continue until this day, until this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ, that's the unique one, that's the Savior, that's the Redeemer, that's the final sacrifice, that's the Messiah, that's the Mediator. That is the very center, the foundation and the root of the message we preach that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that shall rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as we consider what Paul the Apostle has said, you'll find two important things before I go to the message proper but it's very essential and this is very important what did he say look at verse 23 and verse 22 again having therefore obtained help of God uh, you know it's uh, something that is terrible when somebody has resources or strength or abundant supply all the things he needs and he doesn't know to use what he has he has all the help he has all the supply he has all the strength he has all the anointing he has all the power he has all the support of heaven and he does not know what to do with what he has got that's what happens to people that gamble and they win a large amount of money the people who have done research they have told us that those who win such large amount of money that they didn't work for and they didn't know how to spend money it just came to their lives in a few months they squander everything they've got it they do not know how to use it and the people that have supernatural help and supply and strength and sufficiency and they have all the grace and all the gift of heaven bestowed upon their lives and they do not know what to do with it but in the case of paul the apostle paul the apostle said i continue through that help and through that supply and through that power i continue until this day witnessing that's it that's it that's the reason why he said the reason i've got the power the anointing the sufficiency and the reason i've got the unction and the reason i've got all these gifts of heaven upon my life is so as to 
witness i want to take you through the bible i'm looking at john chapter one john chapter one the reason you are called and the reason you're giving the knowledge and the reason you're giving the supply and the reason you have the help and the reason you have the support and the reason you have the almighty hand supporting you and guarding you and holding you up the reason for that is to witness in john chapter one john chapter one i'm reading from verse six there was a man sent from god whose name was john the same came for a witness the same came for a witness the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe he was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light that's why we're here that's why we came that's why the lord has chosen us appointed us ordained us and that's why the lord is sending us so that we can be witnesses in john chapter 15 john chapter 15 verse 26 but when the comforter is come whom i will send unto you from the father even the spirit of truth which proceeded from the father he shall testify of me and ye also shall bear witness the reason why we have the help the support the supply the sufficiency the strength is so that we can bear witness and you shall also be a witness because ye have been with me from the beginning acts of the apostles chapter one acts chapter one verse 21 wherefore these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the lord jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of john until that same day that he was taken up from us must one be ordained to be a witness must one be ordained to be a witness of his resurrection they wanted to choose somebody ordained somebody to replace Jonas Iscariot and the reason you ever replace anybody the, the reason you ever take the place of anyone in ministry has been doing it before for one reason or the other it's now moved to another area and then you take over the reason for that is so that you'll be a witness it tells us in acts chapter 4 verse 33 acts chapter 4 verse 33 and with great power gave the apostles witness with great power the holy ghost came upon them afresh power from on high came upon them afresh a new anointing came upon them afresh and the reason why that new great anointing came upon them afresh is so that they can be a witness and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the lord jesus and great grace was upon them all acts chapter 22 i'm reading from verse 15. acts chapter 22 verse 15 for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard and then in chapter 23 verse 11 and the night following the lord stood by by him and said be of good cheer paul for as thou hast testified of me in jerusalem so must thou bear what witness also at rome and so you understand one thing now and paul the apostle said they go about to kill me to destroy me and to cut my life short but then he said i received help i obtained help of the lord and i continue unto this day witnessing the reason why we have that power that unction that anointing is so that we can witness now paul the apostle tells us another thing in that verse in verse 22 having therefore obtained help of god i continue unto this day 
witnessing what follows I said what follows witnessing both the small and great and you know that Paul the apostle did not know about all this sectionalization departmentalization all the division into small great low high elite peasant the village dwellers the city dwellers Paul did not know about that the Jews the Gentiles here is my field don't come and do anything here here is their field don't put nose don't trespass Paul did not know that he knew that the reason he obtained help from God is so that anywhere there is a creature of God both small and great that he was called to do the work you know there are people that think in, even in our land here they say this area community in the northeast of Nigeria is for this kind of church you know that they dimension that church and if you come and then you come to that area and they say what are you doing here you say I'm a pastor uh-huh what have you come to do I want to plant churches here didn't they tell you that this is the zone of this particular church denomination and then you move to this other area and you're not going to find this kind of church in this other area then you find another kind of church and they say what are you doing here i come to plant churches why don't you know everybody knows this that this area is for this kind of church but you know that paul the apostle did not know that that because peter had gone there he could not go there again that because the original disciples of Christ had gone there and they administered to the Jews, he couldn't go there again. No, he went everywhere. He said, Therefore, obtained I help from the Lord. And because of that help, because of that strength, because of that power, because of that ordination because of that appointment that the lord had given me to be a witness i continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great and you know we have the danger even in our church here our departmentalization is just to help us not forget any area it is not for you or for me or for any of us to just cover this up this is our area man what are you doing here you are state of us here but this is campus work and this is our territory there is nothing like that and then this is youth area what's the region of Asia doing here nothing like that and this is women's section and i see our national of Asia sitting down there and we're having women program this is our territory what are you doing here there's nothing like departmentalization that then screens off all the other people and of course choir orchestra the pastor comes in and he begins to sing hey pastor what's the problem with you this is our department there's nothing like that in our church here because paul the apostle knew that when the lord raised him up it wasn't it wasn't to shield him from this department and shield him from that department that somebody then feels startled and embarrassed and he feels, oh, is the pastor singing? Isn't this our department? Isn't this our area? Isn't this what we are committed to? And if we are here, uh, people that can lead crosses, they are here. Why is he leading the chorus? Because Paul the apostle said that he received, he obtained help, help of the Lord, help of God, so that he'll be able to minister to both small and great and that's what we are going to do 
I said that's what you are going to do. You don't want to misunderstand the scriptures. You don't want to bring, or bring in here that thing they have in the world. And then they say that's that area for this and this, this area for this and that's that area for this and you are not a trespass. We go everywhere. Everywhere there is need. Everywhere there is opportunity. Everywhere there is something to do. Everywhere there is service. By the grace of God as God gives us strength, we go in there and we minister. I said we minister. And now Paul the apostle said he was ministering to both small and great by that by the way what does that mean what does that mean ministering to both small and great second kings chapter 23 second kings chapter 23 and i'm reading from verse 2 there for you to understand that language small and great in second kings chapter 23 and we're reading verse 2 Second Kings 23, verse 2. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people. What's next? But small and great. Now what does that mean? It means all the men, all the inhabitants, all the priests, all the prophets, all the people, everyone small and great. And that's the, that's the commission that Paul the apostle received. He knew what the Lord had called him to do. And he knew that it was not just for this section only. Don't touch that area. It was not just for this section only. Don't go to that area. It was for both small and great all the people. And then it says, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. Welcome to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22, verse 15. Acts, chapter 22, verse 15. He had said all, all both small and great, and now he wants to expand, explain, give us the details of the all of the people, the both small and great. In Acts, chapter 22, verse 15, for thou shalt be his witness unto what? All men. That's both small and great. All men. All men. All men. That's the reason why if the Lord has given you a call, if the Lord has given you a commission, and if the Lord has appointed, anointed you, if the Lord has sent you forth, and he says, you must minister, and you must witness, but to both small and great, that means literally to all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me. By the effectual working of his power unto me, whom I'm less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among who? The Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make what's that? All men. Now you understand, both small and great. Both small and great. And now Paul the Apostle explains what that both small and great, what it means. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, to make all those men know, to make the bow small and the great, to make all of them know 
That's why we come to what does he say? What will he preach? What will he declare? What will he proclaim unto them? The saving gospel. And there is Christ, the Savior, the sanctifier, the healer, the baptizer, the coming king in that single, unique, saving gospel. I'm dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the prophetic revelation of Christ's sacrificial death. The prophetic revelation of Christ's sacrificial death. Number two, the predicted resurrection after Christ's substitutionary death. He died for a purpose and it's so that he'll become our substitute and the substitute and savior sin bearer of all men the predicted resurrection after Christ's substitutionary death then number three preaching the resurrection of Christ with steadfast devotedness preaching the resurrection of Christ with steadfast devotedness we come to number one the prophetic revelation of christ's sacrificial death come back to acts chapter 26 acts chapter 26 i'm reading from verse 22 to the first part of verse 23 having therefore obtained help of god i continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great saying none other things than those which the prophets and moses did say should come that christ should suffer that christ should suffer that is it should suffer the penalty of our sins it should bear the punishment of our sins the soul that sinners it shall die but christ came as our substitute so that it'll bear our penalty and punishment the prophetic revelation of christ's sacrificial death let's look at luke chapter 24 luke chapter 24 verse 26 Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? Ought not Christ to have sacrificed his life? Ought not Christ to have made the atonement for the sin of the whole humanity by suffering? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures that's the old testament scriptures the things concerning himself we're looking at acts of the apostles chapter 3 acts of the apostles chapter 3 verse 13 the god of abraham and of isaac and of jacob a god of our fathers has glorified his son jesus whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go but he denied the Holy One and the just and desired the murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life that's what he suffered agonizing death a shameful death a kind of death that the people of Israel themselves they counted as ignominious shameful reproachful but then it was according to the word already predicted and prophesied the prophetic revelation of Christ's sacrificial death and it said he killed the prince of life whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses, and his name through faith and his name has made this man strong, whom ye see and know. 
Yea, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know I watch that she through through ignorance she did it, as did also your your rulers. But those things which God before had showed those things which God before assured by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer he has so fulfilled and so you know the death of Jesus Christ was not accidental it was according to the prophecy revelation that he will give his life as a sacrifice for the salvation of the whole world and just to go back to the Old Testament, Psalm 22, you will see that the death of Jesus Christ had been predicted and prophesied by the prophets of old. Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? And so you understand, David was speaking, looking forward to when the Messiah, the anointed one, Christ Emmanuel, God with us, God incarnate will come in the flesh. He was looking forward to the time when he will come. And he'll give his life our salvation and redemption. In verse 7. In verse 7. All they that see me lap me to scorn. They shoot out the leaf. They shake the head saying he trusted on the Lord. That he will deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him. Verse 13. From verse 13. The gift upon me with their mouth as a ravening and running lion and poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my body. My strength is dried up like a pot shed, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of wicked men have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. And then it says, I can tell, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me, they part my garments among them, and they cast lots upon my vesture. That's talking about Christ, it was still to come when Psalm 22 was written, but they were looking forward to the time when Christ will come, and he'll make atonement and give his life as a sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, the prophetic revelation of Christ's sacrificial death. Isaiah chapter 53, I'm reading from verse 3. Is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we did eat as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for what? Our transgression. He was bruised for what? For our iniquities. The chastisement of what? Of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him what? The iniquity of us all, sacrificial death. He died for you, he died for me, he bore our punishment, he bore our pain, he paid the price. Christ paid it all. And that's the reason why, when you go to the scriptures, you are thinking about Christ and you want to exalt that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And anyway, you're reading in the Bible as your text. As you are presenting the message to the people that need to hear, 
you are exalting Christ and promoting Christ and you are proclaiming Christ our Savior as our Lord as our Redeemer as the one that shed his blood so that his blood will cleanse us and wash us and make us righteous you are presenting Christ Christ our righteousness and Christ our Redeemer anywhere you go in the Bible Daniel chapter 9 in Daniel chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 24. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to do what? To finish transgression. To finish transgression. That's why he came. To finish transgression. And to make an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So you understand that you cannot just preach and tell stories. You cannot just preach and describe even some of the Old Testament events, the reason all those things were reaching. And the reason all those things were given to us is so that through them we'll be able to proclaim, project, present Christ unto people as Savior. I come to point number two, the predicted resurrection after Christ's substitutionary death. Predicted resurrection. Yes, we've seen very clearly in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant writings that Christ will come and that Christ will die how about his resurrection let's come back to Acts chapter 26 Acts chapter 26 and we're reading from verse 23 that Christ should suffer Paul the apostle said all I'm declaring all I'm presenting all I'm preaching all I say from place to place everywhere I go is that is that which the prophets and Moses did say should come and what did they say should come verse 23 that Christ should suffer but the suffering did not have a full stop the death did not have a full stop think about that Abraham died full stop Moses died, full stop. Samuel died, full stop. And all the prophets, prophets here in the Bible, prophets there in any other place, they died, full stop. But in the case of Christ, when he died, there is not a full stop after his death. You must still go on. You must still move on. And the Old Testament prophets with Moses, they all declared that after his death, there will still be another thing. What is that? Resurrection. Look at that verse 23 again. That Christ should suffer. What mark do you have after that word suffer? Tell me out loud. A command. And then, and that he should be the first that should do what rise from the dead rise from the dead we're not serving a dead savior we're not serving a dead founder of religion we're not serving a, a, a dead moralist we're not serving a dead religionist we're serving a christ to die and then the prophecy, the revelation is that it will rise again. And Jesus rose again. I said Jesus rose again. And that you will find goes through all the string of preaching in the New Testament. They proclaim the death of Jesus for our salvation, for the atonement as a sacrifice. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ for our justification, our righteousness to bring us unto the almighty God. That he should be the first to rise from the dead and that he should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles and you are wondering now that the Old Testament talk about resurrection at all Job chapter 19 Job 
chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 25 job 19 verse 25 for i know that my redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh i shall see god do you see resurrection there I said you see resurrection there after my skin warms destroy this body that's death a man dies is buried in the ground and the worms destroy consume the body and he said after that after my skin warms destroy this body yet in my flesh I thought you said it was destroyed I thought you said it was consumed. I thought you said your body had been eaten up by the worms. Yes, yet because of resurrection, because I will rise again, because he lives, so I will live. That's resurrection by the power of Christ's resurrection, by the power of the resurrection of my Redeemer. I too, I will live i pray that hope will be in your heart in jesus name yet in my flesh shall i see god whom i shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another though my race be consumed within me is going back to the fact that although i die as a human being because my redeemer lives i will live because he rose from the dead i too i will rise from the dead we're looking at psalm 16 psalm 16 i'm reading from verse 8 psalm 16 from verse 8 i have said the lord always before me because he is at my right hand i shall not be moved you will not be moved therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth my flesh also shall do what shall rest in hope you know you don't understand that when you say let his soul rest in peace when somebody has died and then he's buried they say they laid him to rest they laid him to rest he's dead and yet the psalmist said he said not just my soul now look at verse 9 latter part of verse 9 my watch my flesh shall rest in despair in disappointment in regret my flesh shall rest how in hope hope of what resurrection the old testament spoke about resurrection and he said my flesh shall rest in hope why for thou wilt not leave my soul in the grave that's what translated hell there's the grave neither will thou suffer than holy one to see corruption that he is i'm laid to rest after death and yet i'm having hope because you will not allow me to see corruption thou shalt show me the path of life in thy presence of the fullness of joy at thy right hand there are pleasures how long forevermore so you understand the old testament spoke about the resurrection and it's on the basis of the resurrection of the lord jesus christ that the old testament says had the hope of their own resurrection I'm reading from chapter 25 of isaiah isaiah chapter 25 isaiah 25 and we're reading from verse 8 and verse 9 isaiah chapter 25 and we're looking at verse 8 and verse 9 in verse 8 he will swallow up death in victory see that that is uh, when death comes death will not be the final knock 
and the final nail and the final armor that stops and finalizes everything but he'll swallow up death in victory and the lord god will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth for the lord has spoken it verse 9 and it shall be said in that day lo this is our god we have waited for him and he will save us this is the lord we have waited for him and we will be glad and rejoice in, in his salvation we will rejoice in chapter 26 26 of isaiah verse 19 isaiah chapter 26 verse 19 the dead what tell me out loud you see resurrection there the dead the dead the dead the dead shall live together with my what dead body shall they shall they arise christ the savior christ the redeemer christ the one that the grave could not hold because he knew it will rise from the dead and his resurrection had been prophesied and proclaimed and predicted in the old testament he now he put the word in the mouth of isaiah and he said the dead shall live and together with my dead body shall they arise awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust who are the people that dwell in the dust those who have died dust thou art and to dust thou shalt shall go and those who have died and those who are now in the dust because they are buried he says now awake from that dust and sing ye that dwell in the dust for that for thy dew is the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead that's the resurrection over and over we are told there's going to be a resurrection in fact that's why the new testament that's what they emphasize over and over and if i were to read to you the repetition of all those old testament proclamations and prophecies you'll be surprised how the new testament now proclaims everything let me read just one in first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 1 about the death and the resurrection of the lord jesus christ proclaimed predicted prophesied and preached from the old testament first corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which i preached unto you which also ye have received and wherein ye stand i pray you all stand by which also ye are saved you are saved are you saved but each one said, I said, You are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, you will not believe in vain. For I declared unto you, first of all, that which I also received how that Christ died. Why did he die? For our sins. And according to, according to what? to the scriptures that is according to the old testament writings of moses and the prophets he died according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to what according to the scriptures his resurrection had been proclaimed predicted prophesied in verse 51 verse 51 it says behold i show you mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in, and the dead shall do what be raised incorruptible and we will you be part of that when the saints go marching in by the grace of god you'll be there and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality 
then shall be brought to pass the saying this is what we read in the new testament it says when the resurrection has taken place the resurrection of christ as the first fruit has taken place already then when the people who have died in christ when he shall rise then shall that saying be fulfilled that is written death is swallowed up in victory O death where is thy sting O grave where is thy victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the lord but thanks be to god thanks be to god god is uh, god is to be glorified because of you and because of what he has done through christ and because of what he continues to do through christ thanks be to god which giveth us the victory through our lord jesus christ point number three preaching the resurrection of christ of steadfast devotedness preaching that resurrection preaching the resurrection of christ of steadfast devotedness you see the apostles in the new testament the preachers of the new testament they preached the death of christ and the resurrection of christ and they made christ the very center the very nucleus of their message so that the people that had them and they were not just hearing a message calling them to moral standard a message calling them to rectitude a message calling them to turn over a new leaf they were hearing a message that christ was the center and christ was presented as savior sanctifier healer baptizer and the coming king christ our lord and Christ our righteousness and Christ our power and Christ the reason for living and Christ the resurrection of the life and because he lives then in his strength in his power after his example following his pattern because he lives we also will live in Jesus name the preaching of that resurrection of Christ was steadfast, devoted this Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. Acts, chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 22. Having therefore obtained help, I continue unto this day we will continue. Witnessing, witnessing, witnessing. The reason why you continue is to witness and to preach and to proclaim and to tell the good news of the lord jesus christ yes he died sacrificial death and then he rose again to justify and to make us righteous to save to sanctify but to small and great you witness to everyone the small the great the illiterate the illiterate the educated and the rural people and the city people everyone to small and great saying none other things than those which the prophets and moses did say shall come that christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the gentiles to show light to show light the light of his word the light of his way the light of his wisdom the light of the gospel the light of godliness and the light of the mercy and the goodness of god the light of salvation the light of a purified life and the light that shows the way your word is a lamp unto my feet and light for me to direct me to the way of heaven the light that shows us the way unto heaven that Christ after his resurrection now might be preached, might be proclaimed to show the Gentiles the light and call them out of darkness into the light of the glorious gospel. That is what we're to preach. We will preach it. I said we'll preach it. And where the people oppose, they gain say or they receive, you still continue preaching that because that is the reason why the Lord has raised you up. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, from verse 1. Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 1. As they speak, as they speak unto the people, 
the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they touched the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. That's what they preached. They preached the resurrection of the dead and they laid hands on them and put them in the hole in hold until the next day. For it was now even tide. How be it all the same, however, many of them which heard the word, the word of the resurrection of Christ, they believed. And the number of the men was about how many? Five thousand. They preached resurrection. And the power of resurrection arrested all those people, convicted them and converted them, and they were brought into the kingdom of God. About 5,000, even though they laid hands on them, and they punished them for declaring the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that didn't stop them. Nothing will stop you. Verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of what? Of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. The sin they preached and the sin we are to preach is that resurrection. We're looking at chapter 5 verse 27. Acts chapter 5 verse 27. And when they brought them, they set them before the council and the priest, the high priest asked them saying did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name and behold ye have filled jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us then peter and the other apostles answered and said what did they say we are to obey god rather than men and if those people were truly religious people they should agree with that i don't understand why religious people want to exalt themselves above god i don't understand why any religious man any pharisee that says he believes the bible any sadducee that says it's the religion i don't understand why the hierarchy of religion in Jerusalem should ever want to promote themselves exalt themselves above the almighty God I don't understand why any religious man or woman should want you should want me should want us to obey them above God our creator and our savior it should be something that is obvious an axiom something we don't need to prove that God is the most high and his word has authority over us more than any woman or any man living on earth I don't understand why anyone anywhere in the west or in the south should ever want us to obey them more than God and Peter said judge this and you tell me what to do I might bend to you and worship you as God and then put God Almighty behind you. Never. We ought to obey, tell me, God rather than men. All men put together. And then he said, The God of our fathers did what? I love that. I love that. This is exactly why they imprisoned them. And this is what they were just telling. Didn't we tell you? Didn't we command you? Don't talk about this Jesus and about this resurrection. And then when they opened their mouths, the first thing they said, God, the God of our fathers, raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior and to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. The same boldness the Lord gave them, he will give to us in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 verse 18. Now you understand here now, we've spoken about the Jewish people 
are those apostles they proclaim the resurrection among the people that knew the old testament now we come to the people that didn't even know a jot of the old testament these were pagans these were heathens these were gentiles look at verse 23 verse 23 for i as i passed by and beheld your devotions i found an altar with this inscription to the unknown god to the unknown god whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him declare i unto you these were ignorant people ignorant people and these were heathens these were pagans and yet even in that pagan community the apostles will not stop declaring the resurrection of jesus christ verse 18 then certain philosophers of the epicureans and of the stoics encountered him and some of them and some said what shall, what will this babbler say others some he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them who jesus and watch and the resurrection among the philosophers among the epicureans among the heathens among the pagans the gentiles he preached unto them the resurrection verse 30 and the times of this ignorance god winged arch but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained whereof he has given us assurance has given assurance to all men in that he did what he has raised him from the dead you see the centrality of the resurrection of the of christ in preaching the gospel romans chapter 10 romans chapter 10 i'm reading from verse from verse 9 romans chapter 10 verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shall believe in thine heart that what that god has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved salvation depends on that brothers and sisters look up for a minute you'll find many commentaries and many commentaries in the market and now in these days of the computer there is uh, you know a lot of software and it will say you know this commentary and this commentary and this commentary and now sometimes when you're reading those commentaries and you read them about all the description of what happened in genesis and exodus and all that you know if they, they give you some you say this is wonderful when you come to the new testament the first thing you might you know notice about some of those commentaries they do not believe they do not believe in the virgin birth of the lord jesus christ and they are clever those who know how to write they write in such a clever way and before you know what is happening and they have given a kind of a translation of the virgin they just say a woman and then they say you know she got pregnant and they don't tell us about uh, you know the, the virgin birth and then when it comes to the resurrection they just evade that they gloss over that they don't believe i was uh, in a conference and you know sitting on the on the uh, breakfast table and then some of the and i was the only black person there and you know some of them are listening to me and they said what what commentaries do you use and then as we began to discuss they said do you ever use so and so's commentary i said well i know him but i don't particularly appreciate his commentary they said please don't touch it and I, it's just that I wasn't using the commentary. I don't know why the, somebody will not use it because the man was, he had studied Greek and Latin and Hebrew and he goes to history and he goes to many, many things, uh, ancient history. And then he corroborates everything that he says by the time he finishes, he swallows you up. I just say, uh, just not, that's just not my style. I said, I don't, they said, don't ever touch it. I said, why? They said, we're praying for that man. He wrote a lot. He studied a lot but he does not believe in the resurrection 
does not believe in the resurrection. They have confronted him. They have spoken to him and said, no, I just believe God is good. God is merciful. God is mighty and powerful. He's the king of the whole universe and he can do all things. But I about the virgin birth. I don't want to get into that. I don't believe that. That's what he said. I about the resurrection. He doesn't believe. That's why we, you know, sometimes we want to check out what kinds of books are buying over there. That's why, that's why I said, don't go out, just stay here. That's why we want to find out what kind of books and commentaries are coming into your bookshops. Because there's some of these people, the very center of the gospel message, they don't accept. But thank God, we accept the Bible. I said we accept the Bible. I didn't tell those people, I didn't tell them, but uh, maybe I should tell you how God has preserved me. I go to a bookshop and I pick up a book and then the voice speaks inside me, don't touch it. And then I, the first page I open, I see something there, why God said, don't touch it, I just, I just leave it there. Because you see, if the leadership is preserved, the body of Christ will be preserved. And because God is preserving our leaders, that's why this church is being preserved. And you are the top, top leaders of tomorrow in this church. Can you give me a good amen? amen. Don't touch anything that will take away your faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your preservation is the preservation of this church. I'm praying for you, God will preserve you. You see, Paul the Apostle, he said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in your heart that Christ was raised from the dead by the Almighty God, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Go out and preach it, and multitudes will get saved through you in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We appreciate your sinking in the word, soaking in the word, accepting the word, believing the word, and praying through on the word. And as you do, the Lord will bless you. I don't allow